You asked for it and I'm delivering. After I published my previous video about the opening pawn to b3 for white, many of you guys asked for the continuation you voted and it got a thousand likes very quickly. There you go with the continuation how you can apply the same opening weapon for black. And Grandmaster Rigor Smirnov, let's go ahead and get started. Therefore, if white goes for pawn to e4, well, you may play b6 against d4 as well, but against e4 it works even a bit better. Therefore, let's focus on that. It's called an Owens defense. And the first good news here is that your opponents most likely are completely unfamiliar with this opening. They just think that it's something wrong or weird, even though there is nothing particularly wrong with this move. Yes, it's not the mainstream move, but you're not sacrificing anything, you're not weakening your position, so it's not all that bad. And it has a lot of interesting ideas and strategic ideas that I'm going to share with you today. Now, they're likely to play pawn d4 here to occupy the center, and you play pawn to b7 after that to put pressure onto this pawn on e4. And this idea remains to be the key idea throughout this entire opening in various different lines. Therefore, it's definitely worth noticing. Now, white needs to protect pawn. So they play something like knight to c3. You respond with pawn to e6, preparing, bringing your bishop out here to b4, which will pin this knight or possibly you'll be ready to trade it. And that'll eliminate the defender of this pawn on e4, therefore renews the threat. And usually that actually happens. So let's say knight f3, you go bishop b4. Now the knight is pinned, can't move, therefore bishop takes e4 is a threat. Many of your opponents will overlook it. Those who don't will play bishop d3, most likely. Then you play knight f6, bringing one more attacker into the game. Knight takes e4 is still a problem for white. And they have a few options. Of course, the best option for you is they overlook it. They castle or play a3, something they overlook that you can take it, then great for you. If they don't overlook it, they have a couple options. Let's say they can support it with a queen. They can push the pawn forward, pawn e5, or they can try to pin your knight. And we're going to analyze all these options to make sure that you are covered fully. So let's take a look at them one by one. Let's start from the main move, queen e2. Then you strike in the center with the move pawn d5. It's interesting how you keep attacking that pawn on e4 with your every move. And also what I like about this opening is just the psychological power of it. When your opponent sees that you're playing this move pawn b6 on the first move, they think that you're playing some weird bad move and they hope to get an advantage or hopefully some quick attack against you, but it turns out completely differently. They are actually having to defend this pawn on e4 all the time and they think like, what the heck is going on here? Not only I can't attack, I have to defend and I'm not sure how to do it right. And they start getting nervous and very often they'll make mistakes. All right, now they can either take here on d5 or push the pawn forward. We're gonna analyze both of them. Let's start with pawn to e5, the main move. Then your knight can happily move forward to e4, also attacking the white stat on c3 and the knight is pretty powerful here. By the way, white never really wants to trade it with their own bishop, because after that you certainly recapture with a pawn, and then a couple of good things happen. You attack the knight, your queen opens up here, starts putting pressure on the d4 pawn, and actually it's, it's going to be taken on the next move, because the knight has to go away. The bishop gets more open space here, and all in all, all the changes that happened in the position are favorable for black, and that is why white never wants to do that. Instead, they'll probably play here bishop to d2 to support their knight. And then you can go ahead and take it with the bishop. You can start with the bishop take because your knight on e4 is very strong. So you can first take with the bishop and then decide later whether or not you want to trade off this knight from e4. Because it's, again, it's strong and you may just decide to keep it there. All right. Now, I can take either with a pawn or with a bishop. If they take with a bishop, there is a fine line that can easily happen in your game. It's knight takes pawn takes, you play c5, pretending like you're playing kind of French defense, something similar, but after white castles, all of a sudden there is c4. Winning this bishop on d3 is trapped, there's no way to go, and you're just winning right away. So that's a pretty funny line. Let's go back a few moves and see if there's something better that white can do here. When you just took on c3, white could also recapture with the pawn, and then you just still play pawn to c5, putting pressure onto the white center, now let's say white castles, and you do the same. And after that, if you overall look at the position, you can notice that black has this strong knight on e4, give for you, puts pressure here, to the bishop, and to the pawn. You're also ready to put more pressure into the white center, potentially by playing, let's say, knight to c6. 
Or in some variations, you may prepare and play a bishop a6 to trade off your bad bishop, because you have these pawns in white color, and white color bishop, therefore, potentially you want to trade it off. So that's also an idea. Overall, your position seems to be pretty good, and this knight is always annoying, and if white wants to take it, such as the way they did it in the game we're analyzing, if you recapture taking the knight after it goes away, now you can take here on d4, because this pawn is supported by your queen, so white can actually lose the exchange there, but if they want to take here on e4, thinking that, okay, we just traded pawns, you took this pawn on d4, I took this pawn on e4, you continue with queen d5. And you can easily notice that your habit pieces are lining up along this diagonal, threatening the knight directly, and if knight goes away, you can checkmate with queen takes g2, pretty cool. In blitz, they can easily overlook it. But even if they are smart enough to protect their knight, you can at least simply take here this pawn on e5, and you're good to go. Extra pawn out of the opening, more active position, all is just great. That's the potential outcome of the main line of the Owens defense, and as you can see, if white is not playing like super strong, they can easily get in big trouble in different ways. Alright, let's take a look at another option that your opponent has here after e4, b6, d4, bishop b7. We're still going in the most frequently played move, knight to c3, which is actually wrong, but it's the most popular move, because it's certainly not intuitive that this move is wrong, and most of your opponents will play it, which is great for you. The more challenging move potentially is bishop to d3, but I'm not covering it into this video just because I can't cover all of the lines within one video. So again, guys, you can vote if you want the continuation or not, Give a like to this video, and if it gets 1000 likes, I'll see that you still want uh, more about this opening, and I will record it. You may actually also write your uh, questions and comments below, so that if I do record a continuation, I can answer them, because there, there are just uh, too many lines to cover in, in one lesson. So in this video, we're focusing on knight c3, the most frequently played move that you're going to face more often than other options. Right, you're still playing pawn e6, knight f3, bishop goes to b4 to pin the knight, bishop d3, white needs to protect this central pawn, knight f6, attacking it once again, and after queen goes to e2, you finally attack this pawn with your own pawn, and now white really has to do something about this. We analyzed that e5 isn't that bad for you, because your knight doesn't have to go back, it can go forward, so what if they take here on d5? Even though you may take with your knight, which is fine, even better is, I think, to recapture with the queen. Because then, you, you, you can just look at the power that you have along this diagonal. We're opening up the diagonal for your bishop, the queen is also pretty active. You can either keep it here or relocate it, let's say, to h5 in the future. The knight is pinned, so you can never capture your queen, we don't have to worry about that. And all in all, your position is harmonious and pretty active. If white castles, which is probably the best thing they should do, now this knight actually is unpinned, threatens to take your queen, so you gotta take here, pawn recapture, and now it depends on whether you want to keep it more complicated or to keep it simpler. If you want a more complicated middle game, you can just go ahead and castle, so that you save queens on the board and position remains to be balanced. Or you may go queen h5. In this case, now, bishop takes f3 may annoy white, because it will disrupt their pawn structure, and most of your pawns will decide to avoid that by playing knight e5. Then you can trade the queens off, and now we're going into an endgame, which is a simpler approach for you. You can just continue with knight to d7, let's say, and your position is just fine. White has these weak pawns, weak squares in the center, that can be occupied by your minor pieces. Therefore, an endgame does not mean an automatic draw. You can still play on, attack these weaknesses, but overall the position remains to be approximately equal. And again, it's a pretty good outcome. You equalized, you still have some a winning plan potentially in the end game to attack those weaknesses, so you're good to go. All right, we analyzed the move queen to e2, and we know that you're gonna continue with pawn d5, and everything's good. What if they push the pawn forward? Pawn goes forward to e5. They definitely hope for your knight to go backwards or at least to land to d5, but you're gonna disappoint them by moving the knight as forward as possible, knight e4. Because here, not only it attacks this knight here on c3 together with your bishop from b4, but also it gets the d2 square under control, so that if your opponent places the bishop there, you can always just capture it. Therefore, knight e4 definitely will disappoint your opponent. In this position, because you're threatening this knight on c3 with your both knight and bishop from b4, they gotta do something about that, normally. 
Even though the simplest solution for white would be to just either castle and sacrifice the pawn or to just trade off this bishop right here on e4, in the majority of the cases instead of that they play bishop d2. Which, I mean, is not the strongest move, because, you know, if they're ready to give up the bishop, they could just instead simply take here. But after bishop d2, you gotta be quite happy about the outcome of the opening already. Because by now it's already clear that your opponent is not the sharpest tool in the shed, and you can probably push for the win. So let's say knight takes d2 first, eliminating this bishop, queen takes. Now I've got these two powerful bishops looking to start attacking white position and you can even go ahead and take this knight on r3 right away because that will completely destroy the white's pawn structure right here and now you can attack all these weaknesses either by going knight to c6 or even better queen h4 bring your queen to this active position where it starts looking at these pawns and also potentially you are preparing queen side casting because we've got this open file on the g file Therefore, your king may not wish to be castled kingside, but on the queen side it will be perfectly safe. And therefore, queen h4 is a multi-purpose move with lots of good ideas. Now, at this point, lots of your opponents will actually, you know, blunder this pawn on d4, funnily enough. But I wouldn't say that it's as that surprising, because, you know, your opponent wasn't smart from the very start here, playing all the bad moves, and he may as well miss this pawn on d4 and your threat. Anyway, they don't, if let's say they go bishop e4, then it also hits the rook here, so you gotta cover, play knight to c6, but you planned playing this move anyway. And now let's say both sides castle, and we're having this pretty good position. Temporarily, it feels like white is maybe slightly more advanced, thanks to this pawn on e5, but this is a very temporary pleasure that they have, because very soon you're gonna push here with either pawn d5 or pawn f5, and either way, you're gonna open up the position a little, and then all of the white's weaknesses will become extremely vulnerable. For example, just let's say white plays some move, king b1, and you push d5. The bishop can't go away, then you'll take this pawn here either with a knight or something, so they'll probably take here on d6, then you recapture by the rook, and now you can see how all your pieces come together, putting pressure you know, all around, actually, right? So white's position is pretty tough here, probably already losing by now. So that's how it can turn out if white pushes the pawn forward, trying to attack you, it rather backfires, you're getting a very active position here. Alrighty, the final line for today, congratulations if you've came this far, it means that you have enough patience for being a good chess player, because most people actually are lacking it. Anyway, e4, b6. On a side note, if you haven't watched my video about the first move pawn b3 for white, I would definitely recommend that you check this out, because this is exactly the same opening played with reverse colors and of course many ideas are just the same or they complement each other therefore if you watched if you haven't watched it definitely go ahead and do this after you watch this one now e4 b6 d4 bishop b7 still going over the main line pawn e6 bishop b4 attacking this pawn knight of six attacking the pawn on e4 once again we analyze that e5 does not drive the knight forward it's gonna go back queen e2 is okay, but then you strike in the center with pawn d5 and you're still having a very strong active game. What if they go bishop g5, saying like, okay, you pinned my knight, let me pin yours. In this case, you could very easily neutralize this by playing the most obvious move, perhaps pawn h6, just driving this bishop away. And while it can theoretically go back, in, in reality it cannot really, because then you just play pawn g5, neutralize the pin completely, and then just win this pawn on e4. Again, one of the lines many of your opponents will overlook. That's certainly great, you're winning a pawn for nothing and getting an active position. Therefore, coming a couple moves back, the better option for white would be to go ahead and take this knight on f6, which is great for you, because winning an opponent's bishop for your knight is always, or almost always, a favorable exchange. Now, queen comes out, also puts some pressure now, maybe onto this pawn, along this line, it's pretty good. Now white will probably castle, because they need to castle anyway, and also this will unpin this knight from c3, and therefore it's a good time to actually take it and corrupt the white's pawn structure. After that, since you've traded off your dark squared bishop, it's wise to put your pawns or black squares, pawn d6, and potentially even pawn e5 in the future, because this way you are letting your light squared bishop to be active, and you're making sure that an opponent's light squared bishop is dull. They here go rook e1, and it, in fact it doesn't do much, but they play it. And then you just castle, and now there could be a couple possible scenarios. They may either push e5 themselves or not. 
If not, let's say they play some move, you can push there yourself and completely lock the situation which is so advantageous for you, where the bishop on d3 is a dull pawn, right? Can doesn't do anything. Your bishop on b7 is very active, puts pressure here. Also, your pawn always has problems with these weak pawns. Even a2 pawn is potentially weak. Even d4 pawn is under some pressure, right? So that's a long-term problem for white. And white doesn't have any active plan whatsoever. So that's pretty cool. If they instead try saying, okay, let me attack. Woohoo, I'm going e5. You don't have to do anything really about this. Well, man, pretty much any response is good enough, but you can just go back simply, queen e7, without doing anything. On the next move, you can play knight to d7. And the point is, white does not have any active plan at all, anyway, right? You're controlling anything. Your bishop here is doing a great job controlling this long diagonal. And white always has problems with all of these weak pawns. They all are kind of weak to some extent, or they will easily become weak after some potential exchanges in the center. And therefore, you're going to keep attacking these pawns, and white is going to keep struggling finding any reasonable plan of actions afterwards. Therefore, it's also a pretty cool line where white seemingly tried playing normal moves, active moves, but somehow at the end of the day, they came out with a worse position. Right, I made my best in putting as much knowledge into this single lesson as I could. If you want the continuation about this B6 opening series or B3 opening series, give a like to this video, and as soon as it gets 1000 likes, I will record a continuation. Also, you may wish to check out my free masterclass, the best way to improve a chess instantly by clicking the link on the screen. Best of luck in your chess battles, it was Grandmaster Igor Smirnov, ciao!